but in fact he just wants to defend the city and the people. Should one more stone be torn from our city walls, you will be dead before it touches the ground. Stop! I wanted to get a feeling of happening to a set of people who consider themselves modern, because I'm sure to every person in every stage in history, their town has not been an old-fashioned town. Their town has been a modern town, and they are modern people. A lot of people of my generation were coming in from advertising, who knew absolutely nothing. Ken, who hadn't had a, a great deal of experience of directing actors, but had this wonderful visual sense, knew exactly what he was doing. He was able to interpret the book, I think, probably better than anybody else could possibly do. But I think once Derek Jarman became involved, then it became something totally different. I think the, the talent of Derek Jarman and Ken Russell together was made in heaven. But I know originally they had been looking at medieval times in France to shoot on location. And I might remember vividly that when I heard it was going to be Pinewood, I, thought, I felt a sinking stomach and thought, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. But of course, when I saw Derek Jarman's designs, uh, I knew that we were into something really extraordinary because uh, Ken and he obviously had a very, very marvelous synthesis going between the links with the white tiles that meld with the meticulous um, costumes of the court and so on. I knew it, it was going to be a quite extraordinary um, event in, in filmmaking. There were two major creations. The, there was the interior of the cathedral with Derek's black columns, which was obviously quite a surprise for a start. And then this huge set built on the back lot. It was a kind of circular set encapsulating the town square, one side of the cathedral, Grandier's house and, uh, and the convent. And from the back, it looked a bit like the the outside of a bull ring. I mean, just unbelievable combination of Ken's visual sense and, and Jarman's visual sense together, and then bringing in David Watkin as a cameraman. I mean, the three of them, I, mean, I think they created the, the most visually beautiful film of that period, and for, well, for years. I don't think there's another film to touch it, but pure visual style. The film industry in those days was really grey. It had to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and, you, and the hero always gets that, and all that shite, you know, and then suddenly in comes this script, and you look at it, and you start to read it, and you get really excited, and you get excited on so many levels, on, on a visual level, on a political level, uh, you know, I couldn't stop looking at it. Want more crowd? Hang on. Ted? When I read the Huxley and realised that Father Mignon was an 85-year-old dodderer. I mean, I did say to Ken, are you sure that I don't want you to make a mistake? Are you sure you, said, left, you can do something with it? And not many directors say that to an, a young actor. Like, oh, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I'd ever worked with Your darling Olive, Oliver left. Reed. And we rehearsed with two big dressing gowns. I'm saying to myself, right, George, in a minute, you've got to take it off. You've got to have to say, no, 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 uh, uh, oh, took it off. And then when Oliver took his off, big, big snow white underpants. And I didn't know him well enough to say, oi, oi. I was full of that indecent confidence which comes after perfect coupling. I mean, what I love about Ken is the humanity of it. Underneath it all is humanity. Ken is condemned for so many things and, they're, and so false. He's got immense warmth and cares a hell of a lot about, about film and he cares about the story that he's telling and he cares about the characters involved in it. And he goes into rages, but he goes into rages out of love. And to be allowed to use a composer like Peter Maxwell Davies, who was at the avant-garde of, of uh, classical composers at that time, they, were, they weren't going to get a hit, a hit single for the soundtrack out of that. I think I didn't have a problem finding the correct musical language for this very fevered atmosphere. 
I think it was part and parcel of the musical 60s. I realized uh, with that marvelous set that Derek created that this has got to sound as if it's taking place in a public toilet. A sound becomes louder than it is because it's echoing back at you and it begins to have a resonance which you want to get out of. There's a slight feeling that you don't want to stay there too long. I do remember particularly the burning at the stake of Grandier. For the impious one of thy angels who prepared the unquenchable fire, because thou art the chief of the cursed murder. We did a couple of takes of that, and then the musicians went in to hear it, and I remember they were very shattered, very moved, and a couple of them actually were in tears. While it was in production, certainly from the editing point of view, everything seemed to go like clockwork. It's an atmosphere of a party. We're all part of something. We all get excited as we go for fittings, costume fittings, and the thing comes together. And by the time you get into the studio, there's a, there's a sort of identity. He's got a mind which darts from one mood to another mood very quickly, from one opinion to another. I remember him saying one day that this film was a political one, the next day it was a religious film, the next day it was about persecution, pure and simple. He would have different attitudes at different times, and it changed him. He gives an actor an enormous scope, and he's generous, and he encourages an actor to improvise, to have ideas. Confess, confess. Yeah, I get you. So then he'll go away like that. Ready? Go. Confess, confess. That's it, though. He got under people's skin in a funny kind of way. He has great talent for that, I think. He got under mine. We had a couple of damn good rows, which I think we both enjoyed. He's very, very shy. He's very, very shy. All good, good directors are shy. They really are. Never! How many jobs do you actually get paid for being a kid all your life?